at Christie's. $400 million is the bid, and the piece is sold. Art lovers cheered in delight as Leonardo da Vinci's 500-year-old masterpiece smashed the world record for the world's priciest painting ever sold. Once owned by three kings of England, the 26-inch tall painting now goes to an anonymous buyer for a whopping $550 million. Salvator Mundi, meaning saviour of the world, is one of less than 20 paintings by the Renaissance artist known to exist. It shows Christ dressed in robes, with his right hand raised in blessing as his left hand holds a crystal sphere. But its link to da Vinci's most well-known painting is what makes it special. It's a picture that keeps growing on you. It's a picture that has, you know, transcends. It's a picture that you know, also it being quite a late Leonardo painted at the same time as the de Mona Lisa encapsulates all these late characteristics that, that we associate to him. Salvador Mundi beats out Picasso's Women of Algiers, which went under the hammer for $179 million two years ago. This painting, sold for $300 million, also shies in comparison, despite holding the record for the most expensive artwork sold privately. Despite the sky-high prices, auction houses say art is an asset that will always be in demand. So the market is completely global. Now in terms of how is it, in terms of high and low, I think we have we are always in a, this is a market which reacts to masterpieces. So if in a season you're able to get great works, even if economically the climate is not wonderful, you will still get great prices. So it's the quality who is driving the market more than the context. Yes, if the stock market is doing great, if the real estate market is doing well, this is gonna help us. But this is absolutely not the only force driving it. For now, The Last Da Vinci is off the market, and with the half a billion dollar price tag, it has become the holy grail of art. Laila Humaira, TRT World. Well, art isn't the only type of asset that's highly or even overpriced these days. Many analysts say everything, including stocks, property, bonds and even virtual currencies, are overvalued. Let's start with stocks from their lows in early 2009, in the aftermath of the financial crisis, the main stock market indices in the developed world have risen by about 100% in the UK to nearly 300% in the US. And many of them have been hitting record highs in recent weeks. Now, real estate has also become unaffordable in many places. UBS Wealth Management says Hong Kong is the world's most expensive city for flats. In 2007, it would have taken an average person 11 years to be able to afford a 60 square metre apartment. Today, it would take 20 years to be able to buy the same flat. And then there's Bitcoin, of course. When the virtual currency was created back in 2009, one Bitcoin was worth just five US cents. And just look at where it is today, more than $7,000 per Bitcoin. Ben Kumar is Senior Investment Manager at Seven Investment Managers, uh, Management and he joins us now from London. Ben, great to have you on Money Talks. Um, so let's start with that Da Vinci painting. Is it something of an outlier, do you think, or is it a symptom of too much money chasing too few assets in the world? Well, I think a big problem is exactly as you say, there's so much money out there in the system looking for a home. And people are desperate to try and find out where that home is. And for lots of people, that's art. It may be things like precious, precious gems. And as you, you mentioned, just conventional financial assets. It's part of the other problem also that yields are so low everywhere and that investors are being pushed into riskier and riskier assets. Could that create some serious systemic problems further down the road? Well, it's kind of the point of low interest rates, right? It's to get investors out there, it's to get people, you know, trying to take risk. Uh, the problem, though, is that people are now looking at it in terms of an opportunity cost. Why would you leave your money in the bank earning nothing when actually you can go and buy anything with maybe the chance of a big gain? I think that's really important when you consider the other thing you mentioned, which is property prices. If it's going to take you 20 years to save up to buy a house, but there's a chance if you invest in something like Bitcoin, maybe your returns come in over the next year, make, make that house deposit available. That's quite, uh, that's quite tempting for people, and they're being drawn in. 
OK, Ben, so here's the question that everybody wants to know. Are we sitting on top of yet another colossal bubble that is about to implode? Well, so I think at the moment, I'm not too worried about that, just on the basis that people haven't borrowed a lot of money to invest. You haven't heard about people speculating on margin massively. You haven't heard about people borrowing money for almost nothing and then putting it into the stock market or to Bitcoin. When the leverage starts creeping up, it's starting to in the UK, that's when I think you start to get worried about a bubble. For the minute, it's just real money. Uh, that is quite interesting. How are you positioned, Ben? Are you vis-a-vis uh, -vis cash versus stocks versus debt? Well, I, I think the, along with most people, we're very wary of investing heavily into fixed income. You know, when an interest rate rise does come through, that eats away at your capital year after year after year. We've seen that in the US already, and it's going to start coming through in Europe. But at the same time, lots of equity markets look, look expensive too. Where we're really interested is the little niche areas, so parts of Europe, the small and mid-cap sector, and frontier markets, you know, the markets that are even beyond emerging markets. They don't tend to move in line with the rest of the world, but there's a lot of good growth out there. Uh, good growth, but also high risks? High risk, but idiosyncratic risk. That's what's important here. Yes, there's the risk of, hey, the Zimbabwe is an obvious example, the risk of something like a coup happening. But they're less exposed to just monetary flows in and out of the system. When the central banks pumped in all that money into, into the financial system after the crisis, not much of it flowed to places like Vietnam or Thailand even, or Pakistan um, or the African countries. So there's not much money to flow out. Yes, you are taking risks, but if you diversify your basket, you know, those risks can be well rewarded. OK, having said all of that, though, I mean, with valuations where they are, we are open to uh, what I would probably describe as, as shocks, uh, external shocks, and we don't know where those shocks are going to come from. Is that not true? It, well, it's something that everyone has been saying all year, and yet the market has continued to grind higher on the lowest volatility we've ever seen. Everyone's... I think, here's my take, everyone's looking for external shocks that they don't know where they'll come from because the conventional shocks, you know, in a slowing economy, rising rates too fast, that's just not on the cards at the moment. So we're in a really benign environment for growth in, in asset prices. People start looking at the, the kind of bit of the wilder calls, whether it's something like North Korea, whether it's something, you know, completely external and random. And they're just not moving the markets at the moment. People aren't scared enough to sell. Whenever there's a sell, we saw it a couple of days ago, market's down 2-3%, market's right back up again today because people are looking to buy the dips however small those dips are mm, but are we not missing the lessons of 2007 though uh, in this process are we not seeing um, the the rising risks and the justifications of those risks at the same time uh, could we be in a situation three years down the road where we look at this conversation and we go, ooh, well, maybe we missed an opportunity there. I think there's a lot of people who are who do feel like that. We're certainly in that camp of, you know, how cool, you know, we're a little bit cautious. How long can this keep going on? But at the same time, there are so many investors in that position that any any sign of you know, more positive data coming out gets another couple of investors into the market. Any sign of something, you know, markets falling a little bit gets another few investors in. At the moment, like I say, I don't think there's a lot of speculation. There's no frenzy. Maybe in Bitcoin, a couple of assets like that. But in just the wider market, it's the most unhappy bull market we've ever seen. No one, no one thinks it's going to continue, but everyone's reluctantly taking part anyway. Ben Kumar, Seven Investment Management in London. Thank you ever so much.